So to sort of round out our coverage of uh, linear momentum and center of mass, we're going to be looking at uh, the last concept, which is the center of mass. Now center of mass is essentially just a weighted average of the mass in a given system. Now what does that mean? It basically means that uh, you're finding the point at which you can sort of balance the system. So if you were to take a uh, sphere and somehow hold it by the direct middle, it would hand there without it would hold there without rotating. It's basically uh, where the mass is all uh, ends up being concentrated into a single point. So the way you calculate that, it's essentially the mass times its location, and you sum all those divided by the uh, total mass. So more mathematically, you get that the uh, location of the center of mass is the sum of the mass itself times that location, all divided by the total mass. So as an example, let's say we have uh, three weights separated by uh, five meters here and three meters here with the respective masses of two, three, and five. Now, how would you find their center of mass? Well, first things first, you're not going to find uh, the center of mass somewhere in here immediately uh, based on all the coordinates. What you need to do is break it up into sort of the x component of the center of mass and the y component of the center of mass. So like most things we do in physics, you can break it up dimensionally. And now what you have to do is uh, what is described in this mathematical formula over here. Basically you take the mass at each point and multiply it by the x value, then divide by the total mass. So if we set this as, let's say that this 2 here is at the point 0, 0. In other words, this would be at 5, 0, this would be at 0, 3, or at 5, 3, rather, etc. What we can do is take each respective mass, multiply it by a coordinate in the x system, and divide by the total mass to get the center of mass of the system. So, you take the 3, multiply it by its position, which is a 5, and you do the same with the uh, 5 kilogram mass, which is 5 times 3, then divide by the total mass. In this case, that's 10 for a x position of 40 over 10, or 4 meters is the x coordinate of the center of mass. And then you do the same thing for the y coordinates. Both of these are at y equals 0, so the only uh, mass you have to take into account is the 5 kilogram mass, which is at height 3, divided by 10, which means that uh, you have 15 over 10, or 1.5 meters. So in this coordinate system, you get that the center of mass is at the point for 1.5. Now that's all well and good for point masses, but what about something with more of a continuous distribution, say, you know, a brick or a sphere, something that is a bunch of, you know, a solid block? Well, you can't just, you know, what you, what you have to end up doing is uh, doing this equation an infinite number of times, essentially. You have to uh, take the limit as the number of particles that you uh, define the center of mass for approaches infinity. So what is the limit as an integral approaches infinity? Well, we know that, or a limit as a sum approaches infinity. I just spoiled it for you. Uh, this basically becomes the sum of individual points, their positions, times infinitesimally small mass points. So you get their position times tiny uh, masses all over the total mass. And that's how you find center of mass in continuous mass distributions. And even for continuous mass distributions, we still break it up into the x-coordinate of the center of mass and the y-coordinate of the center of mass. In this case, the x-coordinate would be the integral sum of the x-coordinates with respect to mass times the total mass, and y would be the integral sum of the y-coordinates with respect to mass over the total mass. Now, uh, for certain shapes, properties of symmetry can make finding the center of mass very, uh, the process a whole lot easier. 
So, any plane axis or point of symmetry must contain the center of mass in it because you have an equal amount of stuff on one side of the plane, one side of the axis, or all around the point. For example, if we have this rectangle here, and we'll say this has uniform density, in other words, you know, particles over here weigh the same as particles are over here and are just as equally distributed. If you were to draw a line of symmetry down the middle, you'd have the same amount of stuff on either side, so you could uh, spin this evenly, no problem. Therefore, this must contain the center of mass because you have the same amount of mass in the x direction on either side. Similarly, if you were to subdivide it across this way, uh, if it's symmetric about this axis here, then this line too must contain the center of mass because it has the same amount of mass on the upper side as it does on the lower side. And that's the very definition of, you know, y coordinate of center of mass. So at their intersection right here, that must be the center of mass because it contains the x coordinate of the center of mass as well as the y coordinate of the center of mass. Now, uh, this form for center of mass where you have the dm right here is not the most convenient to work with because it's hard to uh, put a value on where to start and stop with the number of mass particles to use. So what we can do is a little trick. Basically we multiply by 1, but instead of using 1 we use the form dx over dx. Now what you have to realize is that dm dx is uh, basically for uniform uh, density objects, it's the density of the object. You have a certain amount of mass per certain unit length, or you know, if you have dm, d area, you have uh, your, you know, area density, and this goes on for all the different dimensions, but we'll focus here right now. Basically, you have to realize that this term right here, dm dx, becomes the density function of the object. So, this makes it a whole lot easier because we can then uh, integrate with respect to length, which we're much more familiar with, and it's much more uh, simple to do. So, these uh, center of mass coordinate equations can basically be transformed into integrals with respect to length by multiplying x by the density function, and then integrating with respect to length. And obviously, the same thing goes for y. You just multiply y by res with respect to its uh, density in the y direction. As our final uh, objective in this video, we're going to be looking at velocity and acceleration of the center of mass. So we'll start off with our equation for the position of center of mass as the sum of its constituent uh, masses and their locations. And then we'll derive this. So, you know, you do dd dt on either side. And as we know, deriving a position gives us the velocity, in this case the velocity of the center of mass, will be uh, 1 over m uh, times the sum of the individual masses times d, that should be an x up here, dx dt, basically. And we know that dx dt is mass times velocity. So this becomes 1 over m times the sum of m times v, or the velocity of the center of mass, because we know that sigma mv is basically the sum of the momenta, because m times v is momentum, we get that the velocity of the center of mass is the sum of the momentum vectors over the total mass of the system or alternately multiplying up by the total mass of the system we can say the mass times the velocity of the center of mass equals the sum of the momentum or when you sum all the uh, momentum vectors of all the individual particles moving about in a system or what have you you're going to get the total momentum of the center of mass and this also means that if you add up all these momenta, right, you get the momentum of the center of mass of the system. If there's no outside forces acting on any of these, the momentum of the center of mass will never change. And this 
follows further from uh, if you derive with respect to time, as we've done previously with momentum, you get uh, the derivative of momentum with respect to time is force, as we saw with our reevaluation of Newton's second law earlier, or the force on the center of mass is the sum of the forces on the individual constituent components. And what this all means, basically, this parallel between the center of mass and the sum of its constituent parts, is that a system can act as one object with its location at the center of mass. And this makes sense when you think about, you know, all the objects we use in physics. When you're throwing a ball up or pushing a block or what have you, you're not really pushing that one solid object because it's made up of constituent atoms. But what we have to realize is that because those are bonded by the forces, the electromagnetic forces, the intermolecular forces, etc., that govern uh, the position of those particles, that by pushing on the block, you're essentially uh, feeling the result of all the sum change of their momentum or the sum change of their resistant force, etc. So, uh, the macroscopic objects we use today are a result of all the momentum and force, velocity, acceleration, etc. vectors of the individual particles that make them up. Now, with that said, uh, that concludes our video on center of mass. And in the next chapter, we're going to be looking at uh, rotation, including kinematics, work, force, and energy in rotational frames of reference.